Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Alan Fanger. Um, I am an attorney in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. Uh, I've been practicing mostly in the civil litigation area for 38 years. Um, it's great to be with all of you. Uh, I uh, My legal career started in San Francisco with a firm called Pettit & Martin, uh, which uh, sadly uh, has long been gone. Uh, and I've been uh, on my own uh, since 1990. Uh, uh, I've also started a company, I've started a company about 10 years ago called Empower Legal. So I started this company with a view toward helping uh, clients better prepare for depositions, trials, and mediations. The idea being that preparation is the key to uh, maximizing results. So this program today is all about preparation and what, if you are a pro se litigant, you can do, or if you are representing a litigant, what you can help them do as, as uh, litigants who, uh, who get the, uh, the, the good service from you to uh, prepare for these major litigation events. So without further ado, I want to go to the, um, to the PowerPoint and we'll, uh, we'll get started. All right, let's start. Let's start with deposition preparation. So um, it goes without saying to those of you who are in the civil litigation trenches on a regular basis that a deposition testimony has a substantial impact on the destination of a case. That that could mean summary judgment. It could mean uh, a, a a very impeachable uh, uh, trial, uh, either direct trial cross exam of your client, and and there are you probably as you've gone through your career you've seen clients make mistakes in depositions that with the benefit of preparation would not have been uh mis would not have been made so as a result deposition preparation is critical to maximizing the results in a case now look it's because deposition preparation is a labor intensive undertaking and you know look with the, the with the advent of ai might be able to make it a little bit easier but there's really not a lot you can do to avoid substantial time investment if you want to do preparation the right way. When I, um, a few years ago, when I went in for the only surgery that I ever had, um, it was um, it was an inpatient surgery, it wasn't long, but the minute I got to the hospital, uh, I sat down with the, the, with the nurse, uh, she went over every aspect of the procedure, told me, you know, what drugs they were, with the, anest the anesthesia that they were going to use, how long it'd be under, when I uh, emerged from um, being anesthetized, uh, what my recovery would be, side effects, what would I be able to do physically? And I have to say, when I heard all that, I felt really so much better. I felt like I was in really, really good hands and my fears and anxieties have been properly addressed. And the one thing I think it's it's easy for us to forget, and this is not uh, this is not an attempt to malign anybody, um, but you know, amid everything that we have to do to prepare, prepare for deposition, prepare for trial, deal with discovery, deal with dispositive motions, experts, confidentiality issues, protective orders, what you would call a law in motion practice. Uh, we, we can sometimes lose sight of the fact that we're a helping profession and that the cl and clients come to us uh, you know, more, more in the individual sense than in the institutional sense. But if you represent individuals particularly, you, you're dealing with human beings and it, it, the litigation tends to be extraordinarily uh, stressful for just about any human being. It's just how we're naturally wired. We see these events as being inherently stress provoking. So for that reason, we need to be, when it comes to deposition, we need to be what I call hand holders. Even though so much of the deposition process renders the client uh, or makes a client feel as if they're not under control. What we have to do as lawyers is just control what we are able to control. And that includes uh, the, the client's stress level and the client's confidence in their level of preparation, which of course really falls on you. There is this feeling uh, that clients have that they are helpless, that they're going to be launched onto the island with no way to get off the island. Uh, there, there are fears uh, about you know, someone pummeling me with questions and I'm not going to be able to answer them or I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm not going to do well. The questions are going to involve a lot of legal terms and I don't understand any of that. And this is something that I have no idea what, you know, how this is going to take place. So it, it all adds up to this, uh, like this, this, this almost like a weebase, a fish stew 
full of uncertainty, unfamiliarity, and just general uh, stress about the process. So, uh, so not only preparing uh, the client technically is important, but also preparing the client emotionally, reassuring them that everything is going to be all right as long as they go in prepared and, and understanding not only uh, the format of the deposition, but also the optics. Again, as Bruce Springsteen would say, you need just a little bit of that human touch. So what you need to do sort of on a macro level when it comes to deposition preparation is to understand that your, your three roles are advocacy, protection, and counseling. Advocacy of the client's position, you know, through their testimony, okay, uh, you're you know, you're going to work with the client to make sure that their testimony reflects the and, and, and maintains the soundness of the client's um, position throughout. Protection of the client's interest, having them know that you are there to protect them against, for instance, questions that might invade a privilege, questions that might um, uh, invade trade secret or confidentiality protections, uh, proprietary interests, for instance. Also protections against questions that go far beyond the realm of discovery and that might require you to uh, to seek relief in the form of, say, a protective order. Uh, and, and building up that confidence, telling the client, yes, you can do this. Sure, it seems daunting, but as long as uh, you listen to my instructions and, and as long as I'm able to prepare you collaboratively, then you are going to do just fine. Now, each client is going to have a different uh, deposition tolerance. I'll give you an example. The, uh, I've, over the years, I've represented a lot of people who were formerly in the military. Uh, and those people tend to do very well in deposition. Why? Because the military teaches you discipline and focus, a, 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 as well as the ability to be what I call unflappable. Uh, those folks are particularly predisposed to doing well in the deposition room. Others, you know, if someone has had like some prior traumatic event, uh, if they're they're presently going through stressful events, if they're going through divorce, if they have financial problems, if uh, a family member happens to be sick, this might you know be layered on to the existing stress that the client has. But understanding the client's deposition tolerance is very important because that's that's going to inform as to the a kind and the, 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 the sort of the quantity and the quality of your preparation. What I always ask people when they come in, like when when I you know get a deposition notice. Uh, either do a Zoom Zoom meeting with them or they come into my office. And the first thing I ask is, what makes you scared? And that really tells me a lot about the client and their predisposition to being scared, to perhaps losing control. And then once I have that tolerance profile, I'm able to tailor my preparation accordingly. The other thing that I have clients focus on is the, the process and not the result. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. If you're a football fan, you've probably seen uh, situations in which a place kicker is asked to make a what we call a chip shot or you know, a, a, a short field goal. It could be 25, 30 yards. And there have been any number of instances where you're in a you're in a playoff game. You've got to make the kick to either tie the game in the final seconds or win the game. And we've seen so many instances where kickers who could make these kicks, make these field goals in their sleep, they miss them. Now, why do they miss them? Well, there are, to be sure, there are certain things that have to go right in order to make a field goal of any kind. The snap has to be accurate. The hold, because of course the, the, there's a holder who then holds the snap and sets the ball down to be kicked by the kicker. That hold has to be pretty good. And then of course the kick has to be technically you know, proficient. Now, why do we see so many kickers miss these chip shots? I, I theorize, and there's certainly a plenty of academic um, treatment of this to suggest that, that someone in this situation is focusing not on the process by which they're gonna make the field goal, but they're thinking about what's going to happen if they miss it. Oh my God, if I miss it, you know, people are going to light me up on social media. I'm going to be run out of town. You know, I, I was going to sign a long-term deal and my agent was talking to the team. I'm not going to be able to, to get the long-term deal. What are my teammates going to think about me? You know, I'm, I'll never be able to, you know, to, to, to walk around town. People are going to harass me, threaten me. So if, if you think about, you know, what might happen adversely if you don't do well, that is going to interfere with your ability to actually perform well in the deposition. What are the realistic goals of any deposition? I think that for, for, for lawyers who have uh, prepared clients for deposition any number of times, they pretty much understand uh, what, what's at stake. Uh, the goal is to, you know, to limit harm, right? Nobody's going to perform perfectly. I have so many clients who come in and say, oh, you know, I'm sure that you know, once I, once I get through this, you know, everything's going to be great. And, what I tell people right off the bat is, look, 
every every case, every position has vulnerabilities. It could be on liability. It could be on damages. It could be on any number of issues. And think of a deposition as a process by which you know little indentations are made in your position. And over the course of an hour, two, four, six, eight, however, however long you're going to sit in the deposition room, in the end, some indentations are going to be made to your position. And that that's unavoidable. So uh, too many clients set the bar way too high. And that that bar needs to come down to a, some sort of reasonable position. The other the second thing the client wants to do is to convey the impression of being credible. That should not be that difficult because the first thing that I tell anybody in a deposition is tell the truth. Right? If you tell the truth, right, you can see points where you need to concede them, uh, then you are going to come across as being far more credible than if you bob and weave and back and fill or just outright lie. And then, of course, you could get lit up like a Christmas tree at trial when someone uh, uh, you know, impeaches you with interrogatory answers, declarations uh, that are au contraire to uh, what's contained in the transcript. And then, of course, conveying the impression of being prepared. And I can't tell you the number of times that I deposed somebody, they they were clearly prepared, and I talked to the client afterward, they want to know, well, how'd they do? And I, my response is, you know what? They did well. They're prepared. They were clearly Spent a lot of time. They went over documents. They went over declarations. They went over interrogatory answers. The the um, allegations in the complaint particularly was verified, and and you know, the client you know, that frequently results in the client you know, rethinking their own approach to the case. Now for some myths that have to be debunked, and I I have to say in, in, in a substantial percentage of the depositions that I've had with clients, their approach initially is well either what they don't have any questions to ask me or. I will explain everything. Well, you know what? You won't. Uh, you remember, I don't know if you remember, um, uh, when Bill Clinton uh, sat for a deposition in uh, way, way back when, during the Lewinsky case, uh, he came away and, he, and he, he actually gave an address to the country where he said, um, I I testified truthfully, but I, I didn't volunteer information and I was not helpful. Uh, and... Uh, you can certainly disagree with any number of things about Bill Clinton, but one thing you, you can't disagree with is that you know he as a lawyer understood that his, his role was not to volunteer information and not be helpful. Um, people frequently say, after they get done with me, they'll want to sell. Um, well, that may be the case, but that should never be anybody's working assumption when they go into a deposition. Uh, people say, I'm going to do great. You know That, that has a, sort of a, a hubris attached to it that I think is uh, a little bit, uh, it would certainly be of great concern to me because it suggests that in the preparation, I need to really temper the client's um, self-expectation. Um, and then of course, you'll be able to help me answer the questions. Um, well, it's not an open book exam. And this does contribute to you know, these feelings of helplessness and lack of control, uh, which are uh, you know really uh, unique to the deposition process. So my preparation um, is to is to start, or that the preparation modus operandi is to start from the general and move along to the specific. So the first thing I do is say, is say to the client, so here's, here's what this is all about. You know, this is an examination. Uh, they're entitled to ask you a wide range of questions. Uh, here's here's the standard. Uh, explain what uh, discoverability is. Uh, and, and then, of course, I outline who does what in the room, because unless you've been in a deposition before, you you don't know, know what anybody does. Like, what someone's going to be sitting there with a with a stenographic machine. What's that all about? And what's where am I going to sit? And, and, and what is uh, what, what's what's going to be the temperature in the room? And am I allowed to exchange pleasantries and, and all that? And then we talk about you know the, the, some some basics like how do I dress? Uh, am I allowed to take breaks? Oh, can I have food in there with me? Can I have water? Can I have notes? No, absolutely. The notes are an absolute no no because you know the notes are either privilege because they were shared with you as counsel or their their notes that if the if the client prepared them well that's fair game and if, I've certainly done that before where uh where I've said you know you get the the, the uh, deponent had notes in front of them and I said you know can I see your notes and you know sometimes there are some very uh, interesting nuggets that are within those notes um transportation I actually if it's logistically feasible I actually offer to pick up the client if, we, if we're driving I actually offer to pick up the client and take them it's just one less stressor that they have to deal with and then um, something else that may not be intuitive to the client, which is, you know, what's what's my role as counsel? Um, and and I make sure that they understand that, you know, while there is a certain uh, lack of control that uh, will will sort of waft through the air, uh, that I am there to protect you. 
And there are some things I can do to protect you. Uh, there, there are some limitations on that, but but you, you should know that I am listening intently to everything uh, that counsel asks you and to everything you testify to, and that uh, that I'm going to be, um, you know, I, I'm to the extent that I'm able to protect you, I will be there for you. Um, and then you know you you, you want to game plan in advance. Uh, this is you know this is certainly it's perfectly legitimate. What I say to to clients is you know I don't want you in the chair for longer than about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and you know, you, you're free to, you know, take a break, bathroom, phone call, whatever. Um, and uh, because like after an hour, hour and 15 minutes, people get worn down. Uh, and the uh, the attention span can start to tail off a little bit. And the one thing you, you're you going to want from a client is uh, uh, you know, unimpeded focus on every question. Um, and for, for Rule 30b-6 proponents, uh, there's an additional obligation and that has to do with the, the designee's obligation to gather the facts. A lot of um, a lot of people labor under the misunderstanding that the designee has to have firsthand knowledge of the facts. So that's not the case. Under the rules, um, you as the you know the client can designate one or more persons to testify on behalf of the organization, and then it's up to the the designee to go about gathering uh, facts from uh, persons in the organization so that they can uh, answer all of the questions that are likely to be answered. Uh, asked of them as a 30b6 deponent the last thing you want to do and i see this far too often is uh there's a you know the, the 30b6 designation of the matters that are uh to to be the subject of the examination and the, the designee goes about you know gathering the uh the, the facts and the information documents if any from people in the organization and they come into the deposition room and then they can't ask answer certain basic questions so what happens you know you have to suspend the depot and resume it because they have to go and, and get the information that they should have in the first place so uh that's that's something that needs to be emphasized when you're dealing with 30b6 um, uh, deposition notices and, and deposition designees. Uh, I did talk a moment ago about the difference between discoverability and relevancy. Uh, there are a lot of folks, most folks uh, actually think that relevancy is the um, it sort of uh, outlines the boundaries of the examination. And as we all know, uh, at least for the, for the lawyers here, that's not the case. For those of you who are who may be pro se litigants who are watching this, discoverability is defined as uh, anything that may lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So it doesn't have to be admissible evidence that sort of outlines the four corners of what uh, uh, someone can ask in a deposition. All it has to do is to be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of, of, of admissible evidence. And that is a much wider, um, that covers a much wider piece of turf. Um, as you know, stipulations at the beginning of the deposition, if you don't explain what these stipulations are, uh, the client's going to perhaps ex experience some angst because it's all going to seem Greek to them. So you want to explain, you know, what the what the usual stipulations are. And uh, for instance, there would be stipulations about how long they have to make corrections on the errata sheet, stipulations as to form, motions to strike. And then, of course, you know, the, the objections, uh, which uh, which may be made by you as counsel, whether that's to form or privilege. And and how how that all plays out. So, um, for instance, if there's going to be an objection as to privilege, how does that work? Okay, you know, they ask you a question. It might implicate conversations you've had with me as counsel. And so, what I'll what I'll do is I'll object and say uh, object uh, on the grounds uh, that it, um, it it may require the client to testify to matters that are the subject of the attorney client privilege. If you can answer the question without revealing those confidential communications, you must answer the question. Um, otherwise, do not answer the question. Uh, explain about how answers can be amended. Uh, there are three ways that that can be done. Uh, I happen to think that amending uh, an answer following a break, let's say, you know, you have a lunch break, uh, you're going over the prior testimony, you realize, okay, I made a mistake earlier, then best thing to do is go you know, right on the record when you resume and, and, and just amend that right away. Um, the the next most effective next most most effective method is for you to do it when you are um, uh, having your own exam of the client. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of it's technically called cross at a depot. I'm not a big fan of having to do that because if you do that, you're sort of signaling that the client might've had some hiccups in their direct. So, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. There are circumstances where, where you are going to have to cross. So that's something you should let the client know is I may have to rehabilitate you uh, if there are some bumps in the road in, in, in the uh, direct exam. Um, and then of course, the least uh, effective method being the errata sheets because uh, the errata sheets just look like a, a long after the fact um, correction and then certainly want to be very careful about changing yeses to noes and the like because that can invite a motion to resume the deposition. Um, and then there's, you know, an importance of, of alignment. You know, I, I like to think of, of this whole process front to back as like a like a seven layer cake where, you know, hopefully you're layering the, uh, the you know, the, the complaint, the declarations, 
uh, responses to uh, requests for admissions, if, if those are served, uh, responses or answers to interrogatories, if those are served, the depot testimony and trial testimony in the perfect world, they all fit neatly and cleanly one over the other. Um, this might be a good time to, uh, to open it up for any questions for what I've said so far. Um, I have a question. This is Rachel Herger in California, sure. which is it, the, the structure of a deposition is slightly different, but in terms of the sort of like big picture concept of preparing a client and the strategy and the making them feel comfortable, um, as well as sort of preparing them for answering specific questions, how much does that differ th from preparing them for court testimony where they will then be cross-examined? Um, yeah. Well, there are, uh, well, it's different because when you prepare clients for trial, what you are doing is uh, when you're preparing for direct exam, you're basically preparing to have them tell the story, so to speak. When you're preparing them for cross, what you're doing is preparing them. You're, you're making sure they understand everything that they have said under oath, every document, you know, material or important document that they've uh, authored, whether it's, you know, text, email, memo, something like that, and making sure that that on cross, they, under, they that their testimony is consistent with what they have, uh, what they've said in those declarations, in answers, depot testimony, and the like. Uh, in, in preparing a client for a deposition, that's 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 a, a different approach because what you're trying to do is anticipate lines of questioning and then work on uh, uh, keeping answers short to the point, not debating, not arguing, uh, and making sure that the testimony is is competent. It's not pulled out of thin air. Does that does that answer your question? I think so. It sounds like in some ways you're both laying a little bit of a foundation, but also minimizing as much as possible any foundation that can then be referred back to at trial. Well, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before we go on to the next uh, slide? Yeah, I got. I have one. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is Dan Jurjadis over in San Jose. I really appreciate the information. You know, I received a deposition notice uh, for a few weeks from now with a lot of uh, requests for documents for the PMK deposition. And a lot of those documents have already been produced in uh, discovery. So just any uh, light you can shine on, uh, you know, like, do they bring, do we bring those documents with them if if necessary? Or do I answer those uh, requests for production uh, within the deposition notice by, by writing prior to the deposition? So any light you may shed on that. Yeah. What's, I'm sorry, what's P and K? A uh, person most knowledgeable. Is that like the 30? Oh, oh, okay. 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 It's a 30, 30 B. So it's a little different from 30 B6. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, so you've already produced the documents? I mean, a lot of them that they asked for. Uh, maybe that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always think it's better to go over with counsel. The fact that you've produced these already and, you know, why do we need to produce them again? Particularly if it's voluminous. Uh, I would think that that's, that, that almost seems a little a little much to be asking someone to to bring with them documents that have been uh, produced uh, previously. But you can also, um, uh, I, I've seen, I've actually done this and I've seen this done where if it's, if it's a deposition notice and it calls for production, that you can actually respond to it almost like you would have would respond to a um like a, a, a rule 34 re uh, request for production by stating you know we've produced all the documents and if you've for instance produced them in bait stamp form to uh, list the bait stamp numbers great okay no, really appreciate it i have a question in terms of sort of the bill clinton approach in terms of not giving too much help to the other side if you have a client and they're asked the question in deposition it makes them look bad, but there's a very easy response to that. Do you want it to clean it up there, or do you want to wait until the actual hearing and play gotcha with them? Uh, you're talking about when, when you're taking a depo, or when you're when when a client's giving deposition testimony. Uh, you're defending your client. They're yeah. your client's being deposed, and they're asked the question that makes them look bad. But there's a very easy answer that will clean that up. Do you clean it up there, or do you wait until the trial and play gotcha with the other side and take that risk? Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I, you know, I would not. Um, I, I'm not big on cleaning things up. Um, I mean, you could you could do it in. In your cross, again, it's so weird to think of it as cross, but when you're, it's your turn to examine the client, you can certainly flesh it out. The, the reason that I um, that I don't generally urge clients to do that is that, you know, if, if it's an easy answer, well, you, you might think it's an easy answer, but then it opens more doors of inquiry. So um, I, I'm, that's just my personal preference is not to have the client volunteer uh, anything. Uh, if, you know, if, in fact, there's the potential for further questions to be um to be asked in follow-up that could, you know, open some more doors that you don't want to have open. So I think that's, you know, if, if, if for instance, you can anticipate that that question is going to be asked that, you know, sort of digs deep and exposes some stuff, I think you could go over in advance with the client, talk about, you know, what the strategy should be for, uh, for addressing that. And if in fact, it allows for uh, some sort of explanation that wouldn't necessarily invite, you know, additional questions that could prove harmful to the client, then I think it, it's okay to do. 
Uh, but I, you know, I would approach something like that on a on an issue by issue basis. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. All right, so so here's some fundamental truths that you know every client should know. Uh, and if you're pro se and you're watching this program, that that you should know before um, before the deposition starts. Um, this is this is like a root canal. All right, it's not. This is not going to be a comfortable uh, process, and there, there's going to be a feeling of you know lack of loss of control, undeniably. And the, the client should just know that right off the bat, because otherwise they're going to, when they see very quickly that they don't have control, it's going to contribute to a very elevated stress level. Uh, uh, going back to the sort of indentation analogy, uh, that this is you know, this is a process, as you know, that is designed to basically narrow the issues by eliciting admissions or concessions against interest. Client has to just get comfortable with the notion that they're going to be making admissions or concessions against interest and that it's okay to do that. Um, that that these workarounds, trying to explain around questions, that generally backfires, as does debating, arguing, grandstanding, uh, you know, calling calling opposing counsel a jerk, which I've seen done, or calling them even worse. Um, uh, you know, uh, false testimony, which is disastrous. Um, and, and to make sure that the clients understand that they're going to be doing a lot, not only doing a lot of speaking, but they really, really need to listen. Because if they, if they lose attention to the question, they could end up answering it uh, in the wrong way, making some damning admissions against themselves that they shouldn't have had to do in the first place. So that focusing on the question intently is really important and explains why I really don't like people being in the chair for more than an hour or an hour and a half, because that's intense. That, that process of listening so carefully and then having to answer very discreetly and in, you know, in, in, in a way that's consistent with no, this notion of a managed dialogue, that, that's exhausting for people. Um, so I really, one thing I like to do is to just give them a three word mantra, which is to, to listen to the question, think about it, and then answer the question. Now, if there's, if this is not a video depot, right, no camera is trained on the client, the client can take their time in answering the question. Um, if you ever saw uh, President Obama give a press conference, <clears throat> you knew that this was a litigator, right, in a, in a prior life, because at his press conferences, they called him no drama Obama, because he would he would listen. So a member of the media would ask him a question, and he would he would take his considerable time and answer the question, you know, slowly and deliberately, almost as if there was a stenographer taking down testimony. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with answering in a way that that is slow and deliberate. It really helps the client uh, because the, the slower you speak, the more you're able to not only gather your thoughts but also prevent your thoughts from getting out of control. And of course, as we know. So many questions can be answered with a simple yes or no. And I I just, I tell clients like, when you go home tonight, like I want you to just keep saying to yourself, yes, no, yes, no. Just get used to that. It's so uh, counterintuitive to the way, you know, we talk to one another. Uh, I, I tell people like, in ordinary conversation, we, we're, we interrupt each other all the time, but a deposition is a managed dialogue. And that's, there's really, you know, no place for interruption, fast talking. It runs contrary to everything we know about the human instincts when for conversation. So again, yes, no, yes, no, no rambling, you know, no explaining, no arguing, and no debating. Uh, and when when we have breaks, uh, I make it very clear, you know, if, there, if there's been rambling, I will you know, read from my notes. Here's where you rambled. Here's where you were trying to explain something which you did not need to explain. Here's where you argued or you were debating and, and, and point out, you know, this is something, this is this is an absolute no-no, right? The more you do this, the more off the rails you're going to go. So, so I have the five C's of testimony. Uh, one is being is being clear, uh, and, and and being clear means not being confusing, right? Uh, being being credible that's self evident. Confidence, body language. What I tell clients is sit back, just sit back. Uh, don't be hunched over in the chair. Don't have like you're you know, look like you're encroaching over the table. Just sit back, almost as if you're able to say, I'm. I'm here to receive any question you've got, and I'm going to be able to respond uh, with uh, with a great deal of confidence. Uh, and that, you know, particularly if uh, if uh, you are uh, representing a plaintiff in a personal injury case, and there's an insurance defense counsel on the other side, you're not going to you're going to report back to their adjuster as to how the plaintiff did. And one of the things you're going to talk about is, well, how did they look confident? How you know how do they that would translate to uh, to trial? Um, consistent, obviously, consistency has to do with this layering that I talked about. I'm trying to have every uh, statement that's under aligned perfectly um that that is the perfect world it's not possible but it's at least an aspirational goal and of course you know the issue of being careful uh and you know, guessing again guessing in a deposition is a serious problem can cause real problems down the line um and what i tell clients is you know i don't know and i don't remember 
that's okay, but you can't use it as a crutch. But what do I mean by that? So, so you, you know, if, if your client doesn't know some discrete things, uh, that's fine. If they don't remember discrete things, that that's fine. But if they have selective memory, that's a problem that can be ex exposed to trial. So, for instance, the client remembers a conversation that was favorable to them, but they, you know, when 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 asked uh, about something else that may not have been as favorable, suddenly there's a, a lapse of memory. So, selective memory, you know, is a problem, and that's something that a client should be alerted to because uh, otherwise they're going to end up perhaps cherry picking what they remember and, and what they what they don't and what they know and what they don't know. So there are a number of different methods of de deposition uh, preparation. Um, there was a, uh, a professor, I hate to say this as a Michigan grad, but there was a professor from Ohio State uh, who uh, came up with the uh, something called the cone of experience. And what he postulated, this is back in the 1940s, is that people remember about 20% of information that they are told verbally and they don't retain the other 80%. So um, sitting down with a client and giving them verbal instructions uh, about at least about the basics of the deposition process and techniques for te answering questions, they're, they're going to forget most of that if you do that verbally. Um, uh, there, you know, there are handouts that people are given and ABA has you know, materials that are used. Um, there's also video training, you know, in the old days, DVDs and now, uh, you know, YouTube videos. There are, um, there are Instagram, there are Instagram um, videos that you can watch, uh, e-learning platforms like the, you know, like the one that uh, my company has where, you know, you have streamable videos. And then you have, you know, mock depositions, which I think in, in cases where there's a lot on the line, I actually think it's essential. Uh, what you could do is obviously you, you have uh, the, the, the mock depo, you record it, and then you go back and you, you, know, you, you go through uh, the, the, the points at which the client did well, and the, uh, the points at which the client was not able to was effectively answer the questions. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, where, again, where, where there's a lot on the line, that is worth doing. And it doesn't take much, you know, just set up your phone with a tripod and you're, again, this is the, the cone of experience. Um, and, you know, handouts, people are going to remember more of what's in a handout. But uh, the, if you present information to people in both an audio and a video form, they're more likely to remember it. Um, so, uh, when, when you're doing video training with, with clients, uh, the one thing you're, uh, that you want them to do is to get sort of muscle memory, right? So if you were like, I happen to be a golfer, if you, if you were explaining to someone how they would learn a golf swing and, and just gave them like some verbal instruction, okay, so you're going to, you're going to stand over the ball and then you're going to take the club away with your, with your, uh, your hips and your shoulders. Like if you don't see that, you're never going to be able to swing the golf club. Uh, correctly. And so much like the golf swing, the depositions, it's just not an intuitive process. It goes uh, au contraire to just about everything we know about dialogue. So uh, when you when you do uh, video training with your class, however it is, you know, have them watch a YouTube videos or mock depositions or e-learning platforms, you're really trying to get the client to have muscle memory. Um, and and I think with, with, with mock depositions, the things you can do are, are to change the cadence, change the tenor of the questions, and get the client to really feel uncomfortable and to try to simulate conditions on the ground as best you can. Uh, because if you, otherwise the client's gonna think it's a softball exercise and, and it isn't. Um, so simulation of game conditions, mandatory. Um, and this, this, is, you know, this requires a great deal of time investment and that is to sort of detach yourself and put yourself in a opposing counsel's shoes to come up with you know, the hard questions. Uh, and, and look, if it's, a, if it's a factually complex case, uh, <clears throat> that may, may be hard to come up with every Possible. You're not going to come up with every possible question, but at least you'll know the probable line of questioning on various issues. And, and so the best thing to do is to figure out where you think counsel is going to be going and then have at least a series of questions on each particular uh, issue. I mentioned a moment ago, change the, the cadence, the tenor, the tone, uh, and, and basically get the client as best you can to feel that discomfort, feel the, um, the, the, the really get a sense of the process of uh, conceding and admitting to facts that are adverse to their own position, and uh, and that that would be you know very very helpful. Uh, I have a deposition preparation timeline. Uh, this is this is just my personal you know shtick. It's not uh, anything that you know any of you did. for any of you you may have your own uh, protocol, and that's great. Uh, this may be considered over preparation, but uh, if if there's you know, if it's a substantial case, uh, I think it's appropriate. Uh, so you can see that. The client received, I received the depot notice, uh, could have uh, the uh, client start reviewing documents, declarations, 
uh, re responses to requests for admissions, uh, interrogatory answers, and then have the client look at a some sort of video, a preparation video, and then uh, seven days prior to the deposition, uh, you know, meet in the office, or if not, then via Zoom, uh, go through the anticipated lines of questioning, have the client view the depot video again, and then have a more intense preparation two days prior to the deposition with you know, mock deposition, uh, video recording, and a critique, uh, perhaps having the client view the depot video a third time, although that's not quite as important. And then the night before, just, you know, have them, you know, liberate themselves from the stress of it all, you know, go watch a funny movie or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever they might do to, to just get a good night of sleep. I would say al alcohol is not recommended because it interferes with sleep and, and getting a good night's sleep is, is really, really important, uh, the, you know, the night before. Okay. That's it for deposition preparation. More questions from you. Um, just on, you know, making objections when, when you're representing a client who's being deposed, uh, you know, do you have to state the specific grounds? I know there's only certain, you know, objections you can make, but just kind of going over, you know, is it just form and only privilege and, and form qualifies for those limited objections you may make or, or just how, how may, how to make objections in practice? Yeah. Yeah. So I've forgotten what the, 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 the usual stipulations are in California here in Massachusetts, the usual the quote unquote usual stipulations are that all objections except as to form and motions to strike are reserved until trial. So uh, so when, I, when I'm representing a client who's being deposed, if there's uh, a, a question that I believe is is leading uh, or you know assumes facts that have not been admitted to by the client, uh, if it's compound, if it's vague, you know, those are those are really the the chief bases for objections as to form. There are probably more that I'm not thinking of offhand, but I would uh, I would take a very liberal approach to objecting as to form. Uh, if, if there's any any remote question in your mind that the form of the question is improper, then I you know, put your objection on the record. Uh, the other bases for objection are uh, obviously privilege uh, and any number of privileges, whatever those might be. Those could be attorney client, doctor patient, psychotherapist patient, clergy privileges, uh, and then you know, uh, obviously questions that uh, invade uh, trade secrets or proprietary information or privacy. Uh, for example, uh, an HR manager is asked about uh, the performance record of an employee who is not a party to the case. You know, that implicates privacy, uh, but, but potentially both state and federal privacy laws. Uh, so that those objections would be permissible as well. Did, did I answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. So let's go on to trial prep. Right? Um, again, stress-inducing process, uh, you know, this process actually, I mean, the stress level is greater because now, of course, now this is go time, right? And there's a lot on the line. Uh, it's a lot, lot more unknowns with trial because there are, the, the trial has so many moving parts and those, those moving parts need to be uh, addressed with the client now. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people will just think this is, you know, crazy, but I've actually visited the courtroom with the client. The client hasn't been in the courtroom where the case is being tried. Actually, I meet them there ahead of the trial date. And I say, you know, this is, this is where everybody's going to sit. Um, I tell them very clearly what the roles of each of the players are. Uh, you know, what does the judge do? Well, you've got a clerk who's sitting up there. What's that clerk do? There's a court officer and a bailiff. Like, what do they do? You know, whatever you can do to just demystify the the trappings of the trial process. That's that's going to make the client feel less stressed. I mean, it's, it's a stressful enough process. Uh, don't don't make it more stressful on them by having them just show up and look around at all these people who are trying to do things in the courtroom and figure out what's going on. It's going to add to their stress level. Um, and you know, explain all the events to them. You know, that it could be explained, could be done through video, but as you know, there, there's also a lot of stuff that happens at trial. Maybe you've got four deer, you've got, you know, you got openings, closings, you got objections, you got sidebars, you got jury instructions, you got jury questions. There's all sorts of stuff. Again, that's the trappings of the process, and the client should just know what they are. Um, you know, in jury trials, uh, obviously that the, the it could, you know, as much as as much as the purists in us would like to think, oh, you know, the, the juries are going to decide the case based on the facts and then the law as as it's uh, uh, given to them through instructions, um, it's uh, frequently not so simple. So that the clients, uh, the clients' demeanor, temperament uh, is it, it, it's all it's all in a fishbowl, and they're going to be watched like a hawk. So you need to you know tell the client, okay, you can sit with me at counsel table, but and you can you know you can make notes and pass them to me, but I, you know I don't want you to to look agitated. You need to be in control, treat it almost like a business transaction, uh, but you need to really 
you mean to refrain from doing anything that will uh, cause the jury to not like you as a as a person and a party to this case? It's possible they won't they won't like you because of you know what comes out in the course of the evidence, all right? But don't make it easier for the jury to dislike you by you know being snarky, looking disinterested, uh, looking angry. Um, just look, you know. I, I would say if there's if there's one if there's one word that I would impart to clients to exhibit during a trial, it's what I call grace, being graceful. That's um, it's easier said than done, but grace is one of those words. I think most people understand what that means. Um, you know, direct exam testimony, we, we think, oh, well, that's walking the client through direct exam is, uh, is really easy. It's not, it's not as easy as you might think. Um, and, and this is where, you know, preparation is really, really important. And the last thing, by the way, you want to do is, is to ask a, a, a direct exam question at trial where the client didn't expect it. Like I've seen that happen at trial and it, it's crazy and it can lead to crazy results. So, um, so the client needs to be made to be humanized, right? This is a person with, uh, particularly if you're talking about an individual client, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a person with, uh, with aspirations and vulnerabilities. And, and, and so that humanizing element should be made, you know, put right in front of the jury so that there is a, a connection that's being made. Uh, and it's above all, it's storytelling. The story is being told through a combination of your questions and the client's answers. And so keep rehearsing it um, and make sure that the client knows precisely the questions are going to be answered. I uh, always give the client uh, my, uh, essentially my questions uh, in written form uh, following uh, either before or after we need to go over direct exam uh, so that uh, they can internalize again what the uh, what the questions are going to be. Confront negative facts on direct instead of awaiting them on cross. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a client uh, who uh, was involved in a dispute with a contractor. The contractor on the first day of the project ended up uh, starting it early and, and busted a padlock to get into the house. Uh, that was that was not a day on which the contractor should have been there because a, a heating system that was going to be newly installed in the house had not yet been installed. And it was very cold in the house because it was a February day on Cape Cod and they were doing plastering work. Uh, the, 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 the job ended up going south. And what did the client do? Uh, like seven months later, the client went to the police and, uh, and tried to persuade them to charge the contractor with breaking and entering. So at trial, you know, I had to deal with this. So instead of allowing it to come through on cross, what I said to the client, I'm going to have to ask him, you know, you guess it was no, no dispute that he'd actually reported it uh, and, and, and had him uh, testify as to, as to, you know, the fact that he did it and why he did it. Better to just get it out there on uh, on direct. If, if, if you were following any of the, the, the trial of Donald Trump back in May in New York, you know that Michael Cohen was a really problematic witness for the prosecution. And Michael Cohen had all sorts of skeletons in his closet and the prosecution uh, appeared to do a very, very effective job in terms of getting those negative facts out, you know, right away, so that uh, he, you know there was a, a, a limit as to the damage that could be done on cross. And apparently, uh, that that proved to be a, a successful uh, way of going about doing that. Um, a lot of people know, don't know about how to refresh uh, a client's recollection, but if a client can't recall a, a particular fact, you can ask whether there's a document that would refresh their recollection. They could be shown the document and then asked whether the document actually refreshes their recollection. Um, I've had to do that. Uh, and it actually is a very, very effective tool because you know, the, the human brain can only store so much information, right? Uh, so uh, just know that that's a tool in your toolbox. Um, there are gonna be objections and the client has to know, you know how to deal with an objection that, you know, if there's an objection made that they have to uh, just uh, hold, hold their horses until the court rules on the objection. Uh, review the the exhibits. You know, if there are hundreds and hundreds of exhibits, that can be you know that, that can be a lot. But if, you know, if it, if it's an exhibit heavy trial, to at least go over the exhibits that are have some material uh, impact on the issues that are being tried. Uh, cross exam testimony. Uh, for those of you who are uh, attending this program as pro se litigants, on cross exam, you're going to expect to be asked leading questions that generally require uh, only a yes or no answer. Uh, and that can be very problematic. It, it can actually be game changing in a bad way for a lot of people. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, anybody who's uh, going to be cross-examined better know what they have testified to, if they've been deposed, what they've said in a declaration, what they have said in answers to interrogatories, requests for admission, responses to requests for admissions, a complaint that is, is what we call a verified complaint that is signed by the client, which uh, has to be, you know, that's done uh, in cases where an injunction is being sought or uh, in derivative, like a derivative action. So uh, 
the client needs to know everything that they've testified to that you know may form the basis for a cross exam uh, question. Now, uh, I tell clients pick your battles, right? So if you if they ask you something and it has to do with something, it, it doesn't implicate something that you have said under oath earlier, or it doesn't have uh, it doesn't impact on a document that you prepared. It's not it's not inconsistent with say a text that you sent or an email that you sent. You know that's fine. You know, pick your battle there, okay? But you got to know where to pick your battle, and that could that could be very very difficult. And you know, your, your your preparation for a client for trial should entail, include some really, really tough cross-exam questions. Again, there's no place for softball cross when you're preparing a client for trial. Okay, uh, we're done with trial prep. Any questions about trial prep? All right, we'll go on to mediation. Um, all right, so mediation of the, of the three major events, mediation is the, the process that I think is shrouded in the greatest mystery uh, because maybe people understand in concept that, okay, you're getting together with a third party, uh, but it, it, the knowledge base is probably not greater than that. So, so demystification is, you know, it's really, really important. And uh, I, I like to think of mediation as being a collaborative effort between me and the client as well as, you know, the parties. Uh, I want to, I want to sort of, uh, tug away the curtain and show how the sausage is made. So uh, the, the, the greater uh, comfort that the client has with the process, uh, the, the more uh, or the better chance that mediation will uh, will lead to uh, to settle the case. Um, I like to make sure that the client has set you know reasonable expectations and goals for the mediation, uh, being open to the process, being you know being flexible, being willing to listen, particularly to the mediator. Um, having respect for all the participants uh, involved and understanding that in, in private sessions that they if they if there are things they need to get off their chest that you know no, knowing that uh, that you know there's confidentiality that they should feel free to if they you know they have emotions they have anger they have resentment that they can feel free to share those within the four walls of the confidentiality of, uh, of the, the mediation process I'm talking about private sessions um and uh, because many times clients they just want to be heard. And mediation affords them the opportunity to, to do something that they might not otherwise be able to do. Um, I like to, in, in damages cases, I like to craft what's called a two number strategy with the client. The, the, the first number being the number that you're gonna start with. That's your first your first demand or first offer. And then the, uh, then the final, the, the other number is the number if, if you are a plaintiff below which you will not go. And if you're a defendant above which you will not go and to try to, to work that area in between. Uh, now, that having been said, you know when we talk about a bottom or a top line number, uh, it, 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 I guess it, it may be sort of sort of inconsistent to say, well, that number it's it can't be a bottom or top line number because it shouldn't be set in stone. The you know you just don't know where the mediation is going to take you. Uh, if, if it's particularly an evaluative process, and like there there are mediators who are more evaluative than others. If it's an evaluative process, then the uh, I really I, I try to tell clients, you know, don't like harden your position. Try to try to be try to go with the flow a little bit. Listen to the mediator and allow yourself some flexibility in your number, uh, because you might be surprised. The mediator might throw some cold water on your position that I, as counsel, have not done. And, and, and if it's let's say it's a retired judge who whose uh, opinions uh, and, and, and perspective should be accorded a great deal of respect, uh, then. That, that I think flexibility is warranted. Um, I always tell people, if this case settles, you are. I can. It's not that you may be disappointed, you will be disappointed. That's by, 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 by the nature of the beast, settlement equals disappointment. But hopefully, uh, over time, that disappointment leads to relief. Uh, again, not as much of an issue with institutional clients, but definitely with individual clients, particularly plaintiffs who come in thinking, oh, you know, this is a moon in the stars situation. And they walk away and say, you know, and frequently say after the fact, well, I got goaded into settling this case. Uh, there, there are good reasons. And as, as I've sort of gone through my career, uh, the virtues of settlement have become more apparent to me than they were earlier in my career. So um, I like to say that as litigators, we're sort of in the business of managing disappointment because, you know, we're so such a high percentage of cases get settled. Uh, and, and because settlement equals disappointment, then we're we're almost like merchants of disappointment. Uh, so again, you want to you want to tell the client what the process is going to be like. Uh, you know, there may maybe there will be a, a plenary session. I'm not not big on plenary sessions, except to have the mediator lay out the ground rules. Um, the uh, 
the you know to, to share the techniques of using a mediator as a as a messenger, uh, rep uh, reposing the confidential information in the mediator to sort of allow the mediator to to, to move toward you know a little you know maybe maybe try to I call it playing the refs a little bit. Um, uh, I always think it's great to get the mediator to originally to originate ideas that are really your own, and this is. This this ha I find this happens frequently if you're close. Like, let's say you're, you know, it, 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 let's say you're getting you're getting close, but you're not quite there. Uh, what I will frequently say to a mediator, like it's a retired judge, I'll say, Judge, what if you go to the other side and say, you know, I've, got, I've been thinking about this, and I think that this case should settle at X amount. This is like this is like my own idea. Okay, um, would you? Would you, if would your client, or say to the client, say to the adverse party directly, would you consider settling at that number if I could get the number from the other side? That way, the mediator looks like you know, he's playing it down the middle. Uh, this is not, and, and, and if the mediator owns the idea, then of course the idea is going to typically be accorded more credence than it is if the idea came from opposing counsel and if it was just transmitted through the mediator. All right, so that's, I've been going for about an hour and 10 minutes. That's uh, it for my presentation. I'd like to throw it open for questions that you have about um, any of the three topics. I have a question. Sure. Um, how do you gauge a client's um, expectations for trial versus settlement? So, I mean, you said for, you know, to tell, explain to the client that if the case settles, you will be disappointed how how can you how do you persuade them that they want to be disappointed first or yeah, at that time, I, rather than go uh, to trial and potentially be disappointed yeah i think the 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 way i've always approached it is to say well trial carries with it risks like just when you walk into trial and you think okay i seem to have like all this stuff going my way here, uh, but juries are fickle. Um, I know for people who do plaintiffs work, for instance, there are there are certain counties, like in Massachusetts, where the rate of defense verdict is is very high. Uh, and I think you can you can say to a client, you know, there nothing is guaranteed. Uh, there are uh, you, you you I'm gonna I'm gonna try to pick. The jury that I think will be uh, will have the the folks who are positioned to uh, see the case your way, but you know they're trying to do the same thing. We may not get the composition of the jury that we want. Uh, there may be some things that we try to get into evidence that we can't get into evidence. There may be some things that the other side we we don't think they're going to be able to get into evidence that they will get into evidence. You know, if you're having an expert, you know, I think my ex our expert's going to do well, but you know, he's uh, he you know he doesn't have a lot of trial experience, and maybe that you know their expert will be more believable than our expert. I think you you can lay out all the risks, all the all the unknowns, uh, and and when the client understands that you know nothing is guaranteed, and there are so many things that could go south on you, uh, I think that's a good way of contextualizing it so that so that a client understands the virtues of settlement. All right. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, it's been great um, having a chance to um, to discuss some of these uh, aspects of preparation. I hope that you can, uh, there's some tips and tricks that you learn along the way that you can use either uh, if you're pro se uh, in your own case or uh, if you're representing clients um, to, to do that in your work with clients going forward. All right. Thanks Great so much. Time.